amen and amen. This morning, we're in Exodus chapter 15. And here's the main idea of this text, the main idea of my message today. God can transform that which is bitter into something sweet in your life. God has the supernatural power through the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ to transform the bitter and to make it sweet. And that's what we're going to see as we look in Exodus chapter 15, beginning in verse 22. I want you to stand with me as we read God's Word together. Let's stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. We begin in verse 22 of Exodus chapter 15. And there the Bible says, So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And when he cast the tree into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance with them, and there he tested them. And said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians. For I, the Lord, I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. So they camped there by the waters. This is the word of God. Will you join with me as we pray? Father in heaven, we love you and praise you. I thank you for this good day that you've given us. And Lord, I pray that you would move me out of the way and Lord, speak a word to your people today. God, show us how you can make the bitter sweet through the cross and resurrection of Jesus. And Lord, we'll give you glory and honor for all that you do. For we pray these things in Jesus' holy name. And church, if you agree with that prayer, will you say amen? Amen. You may be seated. Michelle and I love to watch a show on television that comes on ABC called Shark Tank. Some of you, maybe most of you, have watched it, but it's a really simple premise. So there are these sharks, these investors, and they hear pitches from different companies that want money for their companies, and then they decide whether or not they're going to invest. Really simple premise, but it's a lot of fun to watch just to see the different things, the different types of companies and products that people have. So we were watching just a few weeks ago, and there were two guys who had formed a company called Nature's Wildberry, and they were marketing this little berry. It's a round red berry that when you chew it, just changes the way everything else tastes. Now, it's, it's grown in different parts of the world, and some people call it the miracle berry. They call it nature's wild berry. But what it does is it coats your tongue. You chew it for about 30 seconds, and it coats your tongue, and it blocks certain taste you know, transmitters in your tongue so that when you eat foods that were sour or bitter or acidic, it changes them so that they taste sweet. And so these two guys were demonstrating their product. Now, it's hard to demonstrate how anything tastes on television. Nobody in the audience can taste it, but they were just showing what this thing could do. And so that one of the guys took a lemon and just bit into a raw lemon. And he said, this thing tastes like candy. He could eat it like it was candy. And then he drank vinegar. He said, it tastes like sweet apple juice. And then he ate a sour pickle. He said, it tastes like candy. And somehow that wild berry does something to change the way t things taste so that what was sour, what was bitter, what was acidic and distasteful, all of a sudden is pleasant and sweet. Now, the, the mission of the company is to help people overcome sugar addictions and to help people eat healthier. And it was amazing to me how some of the sharks really got really interested in the product and began to bid against one another and invested in this company. Here's what the Word of God shows us today. God can take the things that taste bitter and distasteful in your life, and He can transform those things into something sweet. You don't have to live long on this earth to experience bitter things. There are all kinds of bitter experiences that people have, whether it's the long-term illness of someone you love 
or watching someone face a disability that just really keeps them from, from living a full life. Or the bitterness of loss, whether it's the loss of someone you love to death or whether it's the loss of a relationship, a abandonment in a marriage or, or, or kids who don't love you and, and walk away from you. All of those things are bitter experiences. And then there's the bitterness of, of losing your job or, or not getting the promotion or position that you had hoped to get. That, that can be bitterness. Here's what the Word of God says. God can take those bitter experiences that we have and he can transform them into sweetness when we look to Jesus Christ. And that's what the message of the cross is, and that's what the message of our passage today is. I want us to walk through this passage together that we've just read, and I want to show you four different things in this text, four different things that God does in this text as he takes the bitter and makes it Sweet. The first thing I want you to see in this text is the thirst. I've just given it the point, the thirst. And the Bible says in verse 22, so Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Now, if you go to the very beginning of Exodus chapter 15, you see that, that those verses begin with a psalm. And, and the people of Israel and Moses with them are singing a song of triumph because God had just brought the people of Israel across the river, the, the, the seabed of the Red Sea on dry land. It was an amazing miracle of God. That's why this book is called the Exodus. Exodus means coming out. And God brought the people out, the people of Israel, out of slavery in Egypt. And then as he brought them out, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and all of his armies were chasing after them to try to bring them back or to try to destroy them. And they came to the Red Sea. Moses stood in front of the Red Sea and held his staff up above the Red Sea, and the waters miraculously parted. There was a wall of water on one side and a wall of water on the other side, and the children of Israel walked across the seabed of the Red Sea on dry land. It was such a miracle that that Exodus event is referred to 140 times or more in other places in the Old Testament. It was a huge event in the life of the people of God. And so at the beginning of this chapter, they've just come across the Red Sea and they are singing praises to God. And now three days later, the Bible says that they've come out from the Red Sea and now they're in the wilderness of Shur. And as they're there in that wilderness, in this desert area, the Bible says they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. They were looking for water, they were thirsting for water, they were hoping for water, they found no water. Now for one person to go without water for three days would be very difficult, but imagine hundreds of thousands of people, men and women and small children, and then all of their animals that needed water as well. They were beginning to panic because of their thirst. It's a picture of life without God. That There's a thirst in every one of us that only God can fill. There's a thirst in every one of us that only Jesus can satisfy. Years ago, Tom Hanks was in that movie Castaway where he played a guy that was on a deserted island and he's there all alone and he's trying to survive and he becomes dangerously thirsty. And he finds coconuts on the island and he knows that there's, there's liquid, there's juice inside of that coconut, but he can't get inside the coconut. And so he takes the coconut and he throws it up against a boulder. It doesn't even mark the surface of the coconut. Then he hits it with a rock over and over again. It does nothing. He tries to drill a hole with it with something that he's put together. It does nothing. Finally, he takes a sharp rock and he turns it into an ax and he uses that ax to open up the outer husk of that coconut and then he was able to break the inside of the coconut but as soon as he does all the liquid inside just spills out on the ground and he scrambles just to get a little bit of that juice on a little part a little piece of that shell and he just drinks just a, just a few drops of liquid it's a picture of thirst without God in our lives there's a thirst that only he can satisfy and you can try to ignore that thirst. You can go to other sources to try to quench that thirst. But only Jesus can satisfy 
that thirst. Years after the time of Moses, David was in the wilderness of Judah. And he was in a thirsty place. He was on the run and he was being hunted down and and they were trying to find him and kill him. And in the midst of that thirsty place, here's what he wrote in Psalm 63 verse 1. Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. Until you come to Jesus Christ, you're living in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. Some of you are in the middle of that land right now. And you're looking all over for something to take care of that thirst. You see, there's a thirst inside of you. There's a hunger inside of you. There's an empty place inside of you that only Jesus Christ can fill. And nothing else will fill that. And some of you today need to give your heart and your life to Jesus because you've become aware of that thirst that's there. We see the thirst. The next thing we see in this text, secondly, we see the test. We see the test. Look in verse 23 of the text. The Bible says, now, when they came to Mara, stop right there. They've been wandering around three days, thirsty, with no water. And then suddenly they came Tomorrow, I don't know whether it was a child who saw it first or one of the women or one of the men. I don't know who saw it first. But somebody saw sort of glistening in the sunlight there in the desert something that was unmistakably a body of water. And they said there's water there. There, There's some type of spring there. There, There's some type of oasis there. And they began running toward it. The people of Israel, all of them, trying to get to that water and their tongues were hanging out of their mouths and they couldn't wait to get something to take care of that thirst. And they got there and they may have had, they may have had cups that they dipped down into the water. They may have put it in their hands or they may have stuck their head down to it and put their lips to, it, to the water itself just tried to lap it up with their tongues. But as soon as they tasted it, their faces turned almost inside out because the water was not fit to drink. Mara means bitter. They gave that place the name Mara because they could not drink. Look at it in verse 23. When they came to Mara, that place called bitter, they could not drink the waters of Mara for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. They, they decided to call it Mara because the, the water was so bitter. Salty water, brackish water, undrinkable water. Why would God bring them out of Egypt and across the Red Sea on dry land and into the desert and then to this water only to give them water that they could not drink. The answer to that question is found in four little words right at the end of verse 25. Look at the end of verse 25 of our text. It says, there he tested them. He brought them to bitter water to test them. And there's nobody that likes tests. I don't like tests. But there are times that God puts us through tests to show us things about ourselves that we would never see otherwise. You know, when a car manufacturer designs a new car or a new truck, they take it out to the test track. And they test it. They drive it through heat. They drive it through ice. They drive it through water. They drive it through roads with all kinds of potholes. They drive it through bumpy roads. They they make it take hairpin turns. They slam on the brakes. They do everything they can do to put that vehicle to the test to show what is there. And God will allow you to go through tests to show yourself what is there in your life and sometimes what is not there. In your life. Now, when we were in school, and if you're in school now, usually the way it works is this the teacher teaches the lesson, and after the lesson comes the test. Isn't that the way it usually works? You have the the, the lesson, and they teach you, and then they review about what's going to be on the test, and then they give you the test. God is an unusual teacher. Here's how He does His tests He gives the test first, and He teaches the lesson afterward. He gives the test first. And then he teaches the lesson afterward. And sometimes when you're in the middle of the test, you don't know what's going on and you're asking God, God, what is happening here and why 
is this happening? Nothing wrong with asking those questions. God may choose to answer. But here's something I also know about tests. Most of the time when I was taking a test in school, the teacher did not let me ask questions. I could ask her a question before the test. I could ask her a question after the test. During the test, she was the one asking the questions, not me. And when you're going through a time of testing, many times you're asking God questions. He doesn't answer those questions until the test is over. He was testing them. You may be going through a test in your marriage or a test with your family or a test with your health or a test with your emotions and you wonder what God is doing. Here, Listen, here's what God is doing. God is using that test, even that bitter time in your life to bring out the best in you and to draw you closer to himself. That's what God is doing with the test. But be warned about this. The devil is at work in that test as well. And the devil will try to take that test that even God has allowed into your life. And he'll try to use it to bring out the worst in you. And to drive a wedge between you and God. And to cause you to begin to, to doubt God's goodness and God's love for you. The Bible talks about God putting the heart to the test. In the book of Proverbs chapter 17, verse 3, the Bible says the refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the hearts. The refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold. In other words, to take those fine metals and to make them pure and to make them shine brightly and to increase their value. They go through refining. They go through the furnace. They go through the fire. And the impurities are revealed and removed. In the same way, the Lord tests the hearts. And so he was testing his people. And sometimes he tests, in fact, right now, he's testing some people in this room today. And even in the midst of that test, he wants to take that which is bitter and make it sweet. We see the thirst, we see the test. The next thing you, I want you to see in this text is the tree. The tree. Now look in verse 25 of the text. And the Bible says this So Moses cried out to the Lord. Stop right there. I want you to look back in verse 24 and see what the people did and compare that to what Moses did. The people complained against. Moses. And as they complained against Moses, the man of God, they were also complaining against God. The people complained against Moses, but Moses cried out to the Lord. Let me ask you this question. When you're going through a test, do you complain against God or do you cry out to God? The people of Israel faced a test and man, they flunked the test. Sort of like the student, college student who went to his professor and he had just gotten back a test that he had, had graded as a professor. He said, Mr. Professor, I don't, I don't believe I deserve the grade you gave me on this test. I don't believe I deserve this F. And the professor said, I don't believe you deserve it either, but it was the lowest grade that I could give you. <laughs> well, that's how bad the people of Israel had failed this test. They didn't just get an F. They got an F minus. They got the lowest grade you could get. Why? Because instead of trusting God and even crying out to God for help, they complained against the leader that God had given them. They complained against God. Moses cried out to the Lord. Look in verse 25 again. Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast the tree into the waters, the waters were made sweet. Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. Now think about that. The tree was already there. In the midst of the bitter waters, in the midst of the test, the tree had already been there. He just showed it to him. I don't know whether that tree had been there for weeks or for months or for years, but he showed him what was already there. And I want you to notice that word showed. The Lord showed him a tree. I've, I've circled that word in my Bible. Here's why. The Hebrew word for show is the same root word as the Hebrew word Torah or law, or instruction. By his instruction, by his Torah, 
the Lord showed Moses a tree that was already there. And then Moses took that tree and he put the tree in the water and suddenly that undrinkable, brackish, nasty water became sweet and they could drink it. Now there was no magical power in that tree. In fact, the, the Bible is careful not to even tell us what kind of tree it was. Otherwise, everybody would be looking for that kind of tree to use it to sweeten up their water. That's not, it's, it's not the tree, but it was what God did through the tree. He took that tree, put it in the bitter water, and the bitter water was made sweet. Now, you tell me, what does that tree point to? That tree is a picture of the cross. Missionary Amy Carmichael, who served a lifetime as a missionary in India, said this, We all know what the tree means. Nothing less than the powers of Calvary can turn our bitter waters into sweet waters. The Bible tells the story of so many trees. In the book of Genesis, there's the tree of life. And then there's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In Genesis chapter 3, the first man and woman partook and ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when they did, they sinned against God and they were banished from the Garden of Eden and banished from the presence of God and banished from eating from the tree of life. In the book of Revelation, the Bible once again describes the tree of life in the heavenly city of the New Jerusalem. And the Bible says the leaves of that tree are for the healing of the nations. There's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil where man sinned in Genesis. There's the tree of life that brings healing forever in the book of Revelation. And in the middle, there's another tree, the tree called the cross of Calvary. And the Bible says, cursed is anyone who dies on a tree. Jesus went to the tree of Calvary. He bore the curse of your sin and my sin on that tree so that we can go from the death caused in the garden of Eden, the death caused by sin into the life eternal that God has for us as his people. Praise God for the tree. No matter how bad my circumstances, no matter how bitter my experience, the love of God expressed by the cross of Jesus Christ will sweeten that experience. You may say, Pastor, that's, that's just too simple to be true. That's just naive. You may say, Jesus doesn't solve everything. You know the reason you feel that way? Because you don't really know the power of the cross. When you know the power of the cross, when you know the person of, of Jesus Christ, when you fully understand the love of God revealed in the cross of Jesus, like that tree thrown into the toxic waters of Mara, the cross of Christ turns our bitterest moments into blessings. Now just think for a few moments about what we've seen in this text and what the Bible tells us about the cross. Just as this tree was already there, in the gracious heart of God, the cross has always been there. The Bible calls Jesus the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And just as the instruction of God, the Torah of God pointed Moses to that tree, the Bible says that the law and the prophets bear witness to the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all who Believe, And just as that tree at Mara transformed bitter waters to sweet waters, the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ transforms the bitter waters of our lives into sweet blessings. And as miraculous as the healing of the waters at Mara is, it's even more remarkable that God would do that miracle for such rebellious people. They were complaining against him. And in the midst of it, he healed them. Oh, but the Bible says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible says even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, God has made us alive together in Christ and seated us together with Christ in the heavenly places. He did it all through the tree called the cross of Calvary. Thank God for the tree.
And so we see the tree. Finally, I want you to see this with me. Think with me about the transformation. The transformation. Now continue reading with me as we move from verse 25 into verse 26 of the text. The Bible says there, there at Mara, there in that bitter place, there where God made the bitter waters sweet, there God made a statute and an ordinance for the people of Israel. And there he tested them. Verse 26, and he said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. I want you to notice God brought the people of Israel from testing into blessing. From testing into blessing into blessing, and then from testing into blessing, and from blessing into resting. Look at what the Bible says in verse 27. Then they came to Elam. By the way, Elam is just seven miles away from Marah. They came to Elam, where there were 12 wells of water. One well with fresh water bubbling over one well for every one of the 12 tribes of Israel. 12 wells of water, and 70 Palm trees, date palms that they could eat from, and palm branches that they could rest under the shade of. Seventy palm trees, so they camped there by the waters. He took them from testing into blessing into resting. God will do the same thing in your life. When you trust him during the time of testing, he will transform that testing into blessing and he'll take you from blessing into resting in him he will provide everything you need when you simply trust in him he does that through the cross of Jesus Christ John Newton who wrote amazing grace also wrote these words about the tree he wrote oh can it be upon a tree the savior died for me my soul is thrilled my heart is filled to think he died for me. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, the Bible says this about Jesus. It says, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. As we come to the Lord's table today, we remember the one who bore our sins in his body on the tree. As we think about the body of Christ represented by the bread, remember, in his body he bore your sins on the tree. And then the Bible says about the Lord Jesus on that tree that by his stripes you were healed. As we think about the shed blood of Jesus and as we partake of the cup, remember that the blood of Jesus was shed that you might be healed from your sin. And so we remember. There's a little church in Germany and somewhere on that church is a stone carving of a lamb. Beautifully, intricately carved. And the story goes that when that church was being built, They were just finishing up the structure, and some men were working on the roof of that church, high up in the air, and one of them fell from the roof, fell all the way down to the ground. And as he fell, his companions who were working with him scrambled off the roof and made their way down to the ground, and they expected to find their friend dead. But instead, he was not only alive, but not even injured from his fall. And here's what had happened. As he fell, there was a little lamb grazing in the grass right below that roof. And he fell on top of that lamb and crushed the lamb. But that lamb saved his life. And so in gratitude to that lamb, he took his chisel and took his hammer and found a stone. And he carved out that beautiful carving of a lamb and placed it there in that church as a memorial. The Bible says that Jesus Christ, the spotless, sinless lamb of God bore your sins and my sins in his body on the tree and by his stripes we are healed thank God for the tree and thank God for Jesus who died on the tree 